Hello, this is the fifth video in this series on random number generators that accompany my book, Random Number Generators Principles and Practices. And there's a link below, or two links below, to where you can get it from. Um, and this is the third in the entropy source uh, videos. This one, um, there's one more, which is going to be on race circuits. Um, <clears throat> but this is on noise sampling. So there are sources of noise in the environment, and you can uh, take that noise and um, uh, amplify it and samplify it and get some, turn it into bits and get some random data. So we're going to look at some uh, some variations. Uh, the three primary types are uh, using a camera sensor, using a Zener diode, and then there's a variation of that using a, a normal diode in a transistor. Um, and then uh, if you happen to have a radio, say you're in a cell phone or some other radio circuit, uh, you can use the error vector from a demodulator. And we'll look at that. <clears throat> okay, so the first one we're looking at is um, a, uh, a camera sensor. So if you think about a camera sensor, it's an array of, um, a digital camera, an array of pixels or pixel sensors and each one of them has some input which is light. So the light is the signal, and we're calling that um, we're calling that S. And then the um, uh, in addition to that, there's some noise that's integral to the sensor, and we're calling that noise N1. Right. So this is supposed to give you the relative relative amounts. There is some uh, some amount of signal arising from the light, and there's some uh, noise, and that's added together. So you get a signal that's uh, a little bit noisy and the more light you get the better because that then you have more signal than noise um, and we're going to assume here that uh, we're using a low ISO number so um, we've got uh, we're taking putting lots of light in to compensate for the low, low ISO uh, so this is how, how you typically use it on a um, uh, a, a, sh a sunny day or a well lit situation if there's enough light you can use a lower ISO um, and and the ISO represents the sensitivity of the camera um, uh, sensor. Um, and then we're going to take that signal and we're going to amplify it or buff it and buffer it. And here we're only uh, we're not really doing anything. We're saying amplifying it by one time. Um, but the process of amplification adds a little bit of noise because there's electrical noise in the amplifier. So what we get out that we're actually then sensing by say passing it into a, an analog to digital converter is that same signal plus the original noise plus the noise from the amplification process. And this is on low ISO. If we take the same situation, so, but we're now on a high ISO, so we've, we've, cr we've essentially cranked up the amplification because we've got less light coming in and we're trying to compensate by using higher ISO. And so we're amplifying more. So we've got uh, the same amount of noise in the sensor but we've got less um, signal coming from the light because there's less light. So we're amplifying it more and we've got this um, noise integral to the amplifier. So what we get out is, um, say we're amplifying three times, is three times the signal because we've ampl amplified it by six, three times. And also three times the noise from that was built into the original signal plus <clears throat> the noise from um, uh, the, 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 that's in the amplifier multiplied by three. So now we've got a lot more noise than we had before. In the previous case, we have uh, this signal and some noise. And here we have the same signal plus a lot more noise. Um, and that's uh, obviously uh, not good if you're taking a photo. Um, and, and in uh, a normal photograph, this situation is what we'd call a grainy image. And the higher the ISO um, and the less light, you, you end up getting a grainier image because uh, the noise is more significant relative to the actual uh, information you're trying to portray. Um, now here, um, I tried getting an example, example of a grainy image which, with my shiny new Canon, Canon DLSR DSLR camera, and I failed because the sensor's too good. So I went and dug out... Um, my very old Canon DSLR uh, with a much less good sensor um, and, and that worked and I was able to set it 
to a lowest ISO of 100 and the highest ISO of 1600. And, and what these two pictures here are of a, um, a small patch on the battery charger that came with the camera and it's a gray box and I just uh, zoomed in and um, took a photo of that and this is a patch of uh, 350 times 500-ish um, pixels. And you'll see in the, uh, well, I'm not sure how clear it is on the video, but on, on this screen it's very clear that basically you have smooth gray here, this little white dot here and here, those are dust specks. Um, but here is the sa exactly the same patch, right? The, the photo was on a tripod, it's exactly the same focal length, exactly the same position, but at ISO 1600 and um, you can see there's grain in this picture. There's, lot, there's no added noise on this picture. And so that's an example. Whoops. That's an example of how um, when you crank up the gain on an input signal, you're not just amplifying the signal, you're amplifying the noise. Uh, and if you've got less signal, and that's why you're amplifying it to get more signal, you're going to get a worse signal to noise ratio. But in our, in our uh, goal of making random number, ge random number generators, where we want a noise source, you want um, lots of noise. So this is a good thing. So a thing you can do is take a camera sensor and essentially leave the um, noise, sorry, leave the camera um, cap on, so it's just in darkness, crank the gain up to the maximum, and then uh, read out the resulting data. And what you'll get is plenty of noise, and then you can throw that noise into an entropy extractor, which is in a later video, um, to turn that into random numbers. Now, I did, uh, I did exactly that with a Raspberry Pi, and I used the Raspberry Pi camera sensor um, and left the, left the cap on. <laughs> so there was actually no lens there. There was just the cap over the sensor um, and set the gain up to maximum. And the reason it's nice to do this on a Raspberry Pi is you have direct control of the camera sensor parameters rather than the camera where, the, where you're using the user interface. Here we, uh, we can just uh, go in and um, programmatically fiddle the parameters. So I just put the gain up full, um, reduce the signal down to the minimum by putting the lens cap on, and, um, and looked at the data. Now what I found was if you take some uh, pixel value, say this red one, and it's, it's an array of, of pixels, an array of values, um, what you would find is it had a very strong correlation with the adjacent pixel and a slightly less strong correlation with one two steps away and less with one three steps away. So there was this spatial correlation and what you find is it's the same in all directions, that um, the level of correlation between uh, the red dot and this, this dot or this pixel is the same as the correlation between uh, the, this red pixel and um, this one, or between two and two, it's the same. Three and three, it's the same. Um, now, when you look out further afield, what, what I found was that the correlation dropped to very close to zero, pretty much undetectable levels, once you were six pixels away. So I was able to take that array of, um, of pixels and just throw away everything except... Um, a grid of them which are six pixels apart. So these red ones would represent the pixels I would take in this part of the array, but it's a camera sensor with uh, quite a lot of pixels. Um, I think it's four megapixels. Um, and so um, that's a lot of, still a lot of, um, uh, of pixels. Now I could have done something more clever um, to, to use the entropy um, in those other pixels, even though they're correlated, but uh, in this case I didn't. Um, and uh, now, now we have a set of pixels which are noisy and independent, mostly independent from each other. And so that's a good source of noise for, a, cam for a, a random number generator. And the advantage of a camera sensor, if you happen to have a camera sensor handy, is um, there are a lot of pixels. So you can get a lot of data out of it quite fast. Okay, so now we're going to look at... Um, uh, Zener diode noise. So Zeners have traditionally been used for noise sources, um, or Zener diodes have, 
Um, and when you look at the electrical, electrical characteristics of xenodiodes and the noise it has, it has there are, there are several types of noise, and it includes avalanche noise and shot noise and flicker noise and thermal noise and 1 over F noise, and, um, <clears throat> and there's probably several others, but I forget them. Um, and when you reverse bias the xenodiode to the point where you get avalanche breakdown, which is where um, it's carrying current in the, in the reverse direction through the diode um, because the voltage is past its breakdown point, um, you find the noise result resulting from that avalanche breakdown actually dominates the noise. And it's quite a nice kind of white noise. It's not um, uh, heavily shaped in frequency. Um, and now here's a paper from Maxim. It's application note 3469. So you can you can Google that and read the paper. It's very short. Um, and what's nice about it is they give you some plots. So here is the um, uh, the circuit that they are measuring. And they've got a 12 volt xenodiode, but they're giving a 14 volt signal into it, reverse biased. And there is a resistor here to limit the current. And so this thing is going into avalanche breakdown and there's a noisy signal on this node that's being passed through a capacitor to cut out the DC component and then they're amplifying it through um, to low noise amplifiers or uh, chips they're trying to sell presumably um, and then out through a capacitor to again decouple the DC um, and they're calling this a white noise generator circuit. Now these three curves, the lower one is the output from, or the, the node at the um, bottom of the Zener diode, and you see it's quite flat. Well, across the spectrum from 0 hertz to 100 megahertz. Now, if you look closely, you'll find it, it, it zooms up here. So that is, um, uh, there'll be a small amount of DC component, which is uh, why it zooms up, but also there can be some 1 over F noise, which starts to dominate. Um, as f goes to zero, obviously one over f. As f no goes to zero, you get a large number. So one over f nodes can dominate. But across the frequency band, it's very spectrally flat. And then they pass it through these two algor two amplifiers. First this one, and then the second amplifier, and uh, you get a get more noise because you've amplified the noise. Uh, but also you get um, some frequency shaping because those amplifiers aren't perfect. But there's plenty more noise here, and you can then sample that and use it as your noise source for your circuit. Now, Zener diodes are not perfect sources. Um, they have problems. Different Zener diodes of the same component value often have different noises. You can find you can get a, um, a batch of Zener diodes and another batch and find the, the amount of noise coming out of um, one batch is, is lower than the other batch. Um, you can find that they don't age well. Uh, when you're constantly putting reverse current through them and things like that. Um, and so while lots of noise circuits have been made using Zener diodes, they tend to, tended to require hand tweaking to make them work well um, and sometimes not have a long lifespan. Um, but this has been a very um, common way of doing it in the past when, um, particularly when board level electronics were being used because what did you do? You look, well, what can I use as a noise source? Oh, a Zener diode, I'll, I'll plug that in and amplify it and, and use it. So that was quite common. Um, we didn't have um, the metastable sources and ring oscillators because they were inefficient in a board level circuit and they require lots of components or they were difficult to build. But, in, uh, but a Zener diode noise generator was quite easy to build. So here's another one using diode breakdown. It's the same principle It's the avalanche breakdown of um, of a diode and in this case it's the diode in a transistor and so um, we have this this is a noise, so noise source circuit and there's breakdown voltage through the di this diode in uh, the first transistor going through here and out through the base of this transistor so this transistor is amplifying this noisy breakdown current and so we get a, um, uh, a bit of amplified noise at this Point, the capacitor removes the DC component and then this, res this resistor pair um, adds a, a fixed DC component uh, into this op amp so the op amp is now um, outputting um, an amp uh, a buffered version of that noise and then we, we slice it 
Um, and what, so what this, what's going on here is we have a comparator and when the, this input is higher than uh, the negative input we get a 1 out here and when the uh, positive input is lower than the negative input we get a 0 out. And what the slicer is doing, it has a long time constant, and so it's finding a point roughly in the middle of the varying signal. And so the varying signal is going above and below that, that uh, the voltage at this node, and so we're getting ones and zeros out. But since it's a noisy signal, uh, that pattern of ones and, zero, ones and zeros is, is uh, somewhat random. Um, so this is a bit of a cartoon circuit. When you build, for, well, build one for real, you're going to be dealing with the power supplies and the details of um, stabilizing the op amps and things like that. But this is a general um, idea of how such a circuit would work. Um, and this, this picture came from uh, the book. And then the last one we're going to look at is um, uh, demodulator error vectors. So um, you're, say, in a, um, a communications device and Usually those, those wireless communication devices have some kind of modulation on the, um, um, <clears throat> on, on the air and that is to convey data. So there are many types of modulation. There's, uh, so here I've listed some quadrature amplitude modulation, pi by four differential quadrature phase shift keying, lattice modulation that you'll find in um, telephone modems, um, orthogonal frequency um, um, uh, whatever the other two letters stand for, OFDM, um, and um, there are more. And what these do is they take uh, a signal and then they measure some properties. And in, in this case, we're looking at a quadrature amplitude modulation type situation where the, the y-axis is the amplitude of the signal and the x-axis is the phase of the signal. Um, and the signal is moving around um, and at specific time points, or regular time points, we, it is supposed to be uh, sitting on one of these four points. So at each point, each time you um, read the signal, you want to be well synchroni synchronized with the signal. Uh, and so there's usually some technology there to send a fixed pattern so you can learn the phase of the, the original phase of the signal before it starts varying. So you know when to sample. And so then you go sample, sample, sample on this varying um, uh, signal and measure the amplitude in the phase. And you try and you can plot it on a graph. And hopefully they are tightly clustered around the points you're trying to hit. And at, the tri the, at the transmitter end, they are pretty much exactly at those points. But the environment is adding noise. Um, and so they don't necessarily hit. You might hit here or here or here or here. And here we have four possible outcomes. And when you're in this quadrant here, you're going to say, well, it's the red one. And when you're in this quadrant, you're going to say it's the, uh, it's the green one and so on. And since there are four, that's two bits of information. This might be zero, zero, this might be zero, one, this might be one, zero, this might be one, one, or some combination of that. Um, and as long as you are cl a, a, a point is closer to one of these points than another, um, then we can say, well, it's that point and therefore that two bits of data that we're, trans that we're receiving. Um, okay, but obviously we're also measuring the noise. So you can think of a demodulator as a thing that looks at a noisy signal coming in and subtracting the noise to give you the data. So here it's, sub it's said, uh, I see this noisy signal, but I know it's closer to this point, so I'm going to say it's the data zero, zero um, uh, by uh, subtracting this value here. So if we look at this this zoomed in um, version of that, here's my ideal point and I've received say this point here and the size of this um, error and it's two dimensions right, we've got the x offset and the y offset, that is uh, two pieces of information which um, is noisy and so we can use that offset and say a, as a source of noise um, and when an, uh, a demodulator is actually running and it's actually receiving data successfully, then the error vector which you get out is um, a reliable source of noise. And you tend to find um, that demodulators actually output the error vector because it can be used for um, training and uh, optimizing the parameters of the 
um, of the demodulator. So there's usually some software looking at the error vector or hardware looking at the error vector and tweaking parameters of filters and things to try and optimize it. Um, but here we're just using that um, that error vector data direct, directly um, as a source of, uh, of noise for a random number generator. Um, and uh, I've implemented such a thing in a, um, a chip that implemented Wi-Fi and Bluetooth um, uh, many years ago when that was a clever thing to do. Um, these days you get Wi-Fi wi and Bluetooth and GPS and a computer all in one chip and it's uh, it's not considered a, 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 a big thing, but back then it was a new thing. Um, and so I was looking around for a source of noise for a random number generator and uh, I, I saw I could just read the demodulator error vector from um, a register in the demodulator. So I did that and um, pushed it into an entropy extractor and um, we had random numbers. So that's it. That's um, uh, a few types of uh, random number noise sources uh, based around um, sampling of noisy signals. The next one will be on um, amplifying noise in a slightly different way and on racing noisy circuits, um, which are two classes of random number noise source which um, are a little different in style and so worth uh, being treated separately. So. Thank you and see you next time.